All right, good to see you all. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to uh, 1 John chapter 2? feel like I've just escaped from prison. Now you got the, the yard spotlight on me. Thank you. <laughs> Honest, I didn't do it. All right. All right, continuing in our study in uh, 1 John. Turn to chapter 2. And uh, I'd like to just back up briefly to verse 26 and kind of get a running start on tonight's study. Now, of course, John has been encouraging Christians, but also as a good shepherd, he's warning them to be on guard. Paul the Apostle said that to the Ephesian elders in uh, Acts 17, uh, or is it Acts, my goodness, my mind, I think it's Acts 20, and uh, where he... Uh, was talking to them and encouraged them to um, shepherd the flock of God, which Jesus purchased with his own blood, to uh, lead and feed the flock, but also to watch and warn, because there's wolves out there. So John says in verse 26, These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it, is taught, it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now, we did touch on this last week. And uh, once again, when John says the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, he's referring to the indwelling Holy Spirit that resides in every believer. In fact, Paul said in Romans 8 verse 9, he said, but uh, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And there, in that context, the flesh represents unbelief. The spirit, of course, speaks of a believer. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. In other words, all true Christians have the Holy Spirit in them given to them by the Lord Jesus the instant they received him as Lord and Savior. So uh, the anointing that John is referring to, I believe, uh, is that indwelling of the Holy Spirit once a person gets saved. And the Holy Spirit comes in and, of course, gives us the ability to understand the Word, uh, to give the proper uh, interpretation, to apply it into our lives. But if you study the concept of being anointed by the Holy Spirit through the New Testament... It's bigger, a bigger subject than just what John has in mind here. As important as what John is saying is, it's foundational. Uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit goes beyond uh, just being indwelt by the Spirit at the moment of conversion. Uh, as you study this concept, uh, and again, uh, all believers have the Holy Spirit within them. That happens at the moment of salvation. But there's a deeper level of anointing that we read about in the New Testament. It's called the baptism with the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit comes upon the believer. What is the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Well, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is the baptism of power that equip, equips believers for the work God is calling them to do. So it equips us for service. Service. The Lord Jesus Christ has got a ministry for every one of us. And uh, the power to do that ministry has to come from the Holy Spirit. It's, it's extremely important to understand, to note, that as the Lord Jesus Christ prepared to begin his public ministry, he took a 60-mile walk from Galilee down to the lower Jordan to, to be baptized by John the Baptist. To make a journey of that distance on foot indicates that he believed it to be very important in launching his public ministry, in fact, essential, essential. Turn to Luke 3. I would like to just talk about this for a few minutes before we get back to our study in John, 1 John. Since this is just such an important subject. So Jesus walks the 60 miles from Galilee down to the lower Jordan, where he was then baptized by John. We read that in Luke 3, verses 21 and 2. 
When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. I want you to notice the wording of verse 22. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. Let me say, and we'll get into this in greater detail when we come to it in John's Gospel, chapter 14. But let me just say here tonight that Jesus spoke of three levels of relationship with the Holy Spirit uh, that a person can have with the Spirit. Three levels of relationship that the Holy Spirit can have with a person. They are ascending levels of relationship. In other words, they build upon each other. Jesus outlined these three levels using three different Greek prepositions, each one corresponding to one of these levels. Turn to John 14. I'll go through these briefly so you have uh, just an understanding of what we're talking about. Of course, John 14 is in the upper room the night before the crucifixion. As Jesus was spending the evening with his disciples, encouraging them, because he was soon going to be taken away from them for a time, and their hearts were going to be very sorrowful, but then Jesus said, your sorrow is going to be turned into great joy. Yes, three days later, when he realized that, uh, when they realized he had risen. But uh, he says to them in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. There are the first two Greek prepositions, for he dwells with you. Greek word is para, and will be in you. Second Greek preposition, en, en. The Holy Spirit is with every person in the world who is not a believer, wooing them, drawing them to Christ. When they open their heart to Jesus, he stops being with them and comes inside of them to take up residence. That's what it means to be born again. The Spirit of God is now in us, right? Then we fast forward three days to Sunday. Now that was in the upper room the night before the crucifixion. Next day Jesus is crucified. He's in the grave for three days. We fast forward to Sunday. The day Jesus rose from the dead. Turn to John 20. Then that same day at evening. This is the day of the resurrection. Sunday evening. Being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, the Jewish leadership that had crucified Christ, they were afraid they were coming for them next. For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. He goes on to say, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. What has just happened? Well, the Holy Spirit had been with them, as Jesus said in John 14, the night before the crucifixion. That was the Old Testament relationship of the Holy Spirit with a believer. He was with uh, believers, okay? But now Jesus breathes on them, and the Spirit comes inside of them. All right? he, was, he is with you. He will be in you. Well, now He is in them. What has happened? Well, the Bible says you cannot be a true New Testament Christian unless you believe in the resurrection. That's essential doctrine for salvation and to be a Christian, right? Remember now, these guys didn't believe that the resurrection had happened when it first happened. That Sunday morning when the women came from the tomb to say the tomb is empty, the stone has been rolled away, and an angel told us, told us he's not 
no longer dead, he is risen, they say, ah, you're crazy. Even though Jesus had told them he was going to die and three days later rise from the dead, at least three, maybe four times before he actually went to the cross, they didn't believe. They didn't believe until they went to the tomb themselves and saw the tomb was empty. So in the evening, now here comes Jesus, all right? Now they see the risen Christ. They believe with all their hearts he has risen. And now he's able to breathe on them and the Spirit comes in them. And now at this point, they are genuine New Testament Christians. Again, because Paul said in Romans 8 and 9, nobody can be a true Christian unless the Holy Spirit is in them. Again, all true Christians have the Spirit in them, but not all true Christians have the Holy Spirit upon them. That's where I'm going with this. This is what the Bible calls the baptism with the Holy Spirit, which is, guys, a separate and often subsequent work. It doesn't, doesn't always happen in the moment of salvation. Uh, you can check, uh, you know, Acts 10 with Cornelius. He got saved and he got baptized in the Spirit all at the same time. So God's not limited. He's not bound by any rules. Uh, but most of the time uh, in the New Testament, people receive Christ. And then somewhere down the road, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And again, this baptism was absolutely essential for service because it supplies the power necessary for doing the work God has called each of us to do. Remember now, Jesus had commissioned these very men to go into all the world and preach the good news, the gospel, to everyone. He did that before he ascended back to the Father. He's been in heaven now for 10 days, and uh, he uh, prays the Father, and the Father on the day of Pentecost sends the Holy Spirit upon his disciples. Let me just back up and say this, though. He has commissioned them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, how are they going to do that? Remember, these were simple, uneducated men. I mean, how in the world were they going to go into all the world? I'm talking about the areas of learning and sophistication, like Athens, Alexandria, Rome, uh, places that, you know, how were these very simple, blue-collar guys, fishermen and whatever, how were they going to go into all the world? Who was going to listen to them? Who would pay them any mind at all? How were they going to impact the world for Jesus Christ? The answer God was going to undo them with supernatural power from on high and was going to do, to do the work through them. And this is where the third Greek preposition comes into play. Turn to Luke 24. This is after his resurrection before he ascends back to his father. Luke 24, verse 49. He said, Behold, I send the promise of my father, and here's the third Greek preposition, upon you, a P. He is with you, he shall be in you, but when he comes upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with power from on high. Turn to Acts chapter 1. This is the parallel passage. Luke begins Acts with the how his gospel ended. His gospel ended with Jesus telling his disciples to go back to Jerusalem and wait until the promise of the Father was poured out upon them, this empowering he told them about in the upper room. He was said, I'm going back to my father. I'm, not, I'm going away. I'm not going to leave you alone like orphans, though. When I go back to my father, I will pray the father. He will send to you another helper, another uh, comforter, the Holy Spirit. But go back and wait. Now, this is after the resurrection. Go back and wait now in Jerusalem until this event happens, right? Chapter 1 of Acts, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 8, But you shall receive power. That's the Greek word dunamis. We get the English word dynamic and dynamite 
from that Greek word, you shall receive dynamic power is the idea when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me. There's the service, okay? You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. All right, so they go back to Jerusalem as he has commanded them. They're waiting for this empowering. They're not sure what to make of it. They're not sure what it's going to look like or even feel like, but they know the Lord said, go back to Jerusalem. You've been with me three and a half years. You know the gospel cold. They could recite it, no doubt, in their sleep. He said, you got the information in your heads. You don't have the power to preach the gospel yet. So go back to Jerusalem and wait there until you're endued with this power from on high. So Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there, there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means to have the Spirit upon you. Some say it's like an overflowing, all right? Where the Spirit is in you, but now He comes upon you in the sense you are absolutely immersed in the Holy Spirit. This is what the word baptism, by the way, means, to immerse. You find the word associated with different mediums to be, that people were baptized into. Uh, Jesus said, I have a baptism that I must be baptized with, and I can't wait for it to be accomplished. Speaking of how he was immersed in his mission to die for our sins. You can be baptized in water, of course, immersed. That's what we usually think of when we hear the word baptism. But um, there is an, also a baptism into or with the Holy Spirit, and that is the empowering for service. Turn over to Acts 2, verse 38. So the Spirit comes upon them, people that were in town, pilgrims for the Feast of Pentecost, heard this hurricane, okay, tornado, you know, sound, and they rushed to where the sound was, was you know, seems to be located, and uh, saw the disciples, and, and they all heard them speaking in the various dialects from all over the known world where these pilgrims had come from speaking the wonderful works of God and their conclusion was these men were drunk and Peter gets up and says men and brethren these men are not drunk as you suppose uh, since it's only nine o'clock in the morning but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel I, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh in the end times basically and your young men shall see vision uh, your old men shall see visions young men shall dream dreams I think that's where it works you know, Acts 2, you can check it out, okay? Um, but Peter, you know, they, they, Peter then preaches to them this dynamic sermon. And they said, they were cut to the heart and said, men and brethren, what must we do? Spirit-filled conviction, spirit-filled preaching. And Peter said, verse 38, to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, that's salvation, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And I believe the promise, the gift of the Holy Spirit, is the promise that Jesus promised his disciples in the upper room before he went to the cross, that he was going to send them out into all the world, but he wouldn't send them out alone uh, without the, the help of God. The Spirit would come back and indwell them and to overflow them, and they would be used by God to touch the entire world for Christ. The result, 3,000 men, plus women and young people, were saved on that day, the day of Pentecost. Of course, the church was born, hit the ground running, maybe fifteen to 20,000 people got saved that day, and the church was born. And boy, did the nursery have problems. 
Uh, that's a lot of folks to uh, suddenly dump on the nursery staff, right? So, uh, but, but it's important for us to understand that Jesus, the Son of God in his humanity, waited 30 years until he was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and only then did he begin his public ministry by going back up to Nazareth, to the synagogue, and what did he say as he quoted from Isaiah, right? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't begin his public ministry until he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I mean, how absurd is, absurd is it for us to think that we can do anything for God in the way of ministry without the same power Jesus knew that he needed to do the work the Father had given him to do? And guys, I've said it before. Let me say it again. I believe that this is one of the greatest needs, if not the greatest need, in the church of Jesus Christ today, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work of God. We don't need it anymore. It's, it's not even around anymore. It, it, that was done in the first century. So what do you do for power now? We go to seminary. We get our degrees. We can handle it. Yeah, right. We're doing a great job, right? I believe this is the single greatest reason the church is so ineffective in changing lives. The gospel is all about changing lives. I'm not saying the church is ineffective at sticking bodies in the seats. It's a lot of mega churches. I mean, you know, a lot of folks come into church. I don't know how many are really coming to Christ. And having said that, I want to see a changed life before I get real excited about how many folks, uh, because they come to church, where's the transformation? And that's what I'm talking about. Churches are loaded, many of them, mega churches, packed. Yet I see Christians going out and sleeping with their boyfriends or their girlfriends or taking drugs or living the same basic life they lived before they they so-called became before they you know became christians so-called jesus said against his church the gates of hell would not prevail if you look around america is the are the gates of hell prevailing i think so why is that Jesus promised us we'd be victorious because we're trying to do the work of God in the energy of our flesh, not in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're trying to do God's work in our own strength, ingenuity, and intelligence and not in the Spirit's power. He never intended us to serve Him with our own strength. You need to understand that the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry on the earth were not done in his power as the second person of the Trinity, but in the power of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Peter makes that clear in Acts chapter 10. Let me read to you verse 38. Talking about the Lord Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And guys, that is how Jesus did the work of God. And that is how we must do the work of God in the same power of the Holy Spirit. So the question is then, how do I receive, how do I receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit? If that's what you're thinking, well, let me just ask you this. How do you, how do you receive anything from God? You simply ask in faith. Is he giving it? Is he offering it? Absolutely. I mean, is he offering salvation to unbelievers? How do you receive it? You just accept it by faith. Everything we, we receive from God is a gift from his gracious hand. And to receive any of God's gifts, whatever they are, you ask and you receive by faith. Turn to Luke chapter 11. Let me read to you one passage that you're very familiar with. Jesus is teaching his disciples about the importance of prayer and persistent prayer. 
Luke 11, verse 9. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. The Greek is seek and keep on seeking, and it will be given to you. Ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking. Persistence. Verse 10, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he, he asks for a fish, what father would give him a serpent instead of a fish, is what Jesus is saying. Verse 12, or if he asks for an egg, uh, will any father offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You ask, and you receive, by faith. But I, I just want to say this, though. There are examples where the baptism of the Holy Spirit seems to have been withheld for a time. Why? If it's an empowering for service, and a person's heart is lifted up with pride, and God knows that if He uses that person for service, it will only fuel their pride, He will wait until they're humbled and broken before He blesses them with power to serve Him. And I've read many stories where the baptism was withheld from someone a Christian, until God was able to break them and humble them. I'd like to share with you just a little from the life of Dr. Walter Wilson, uh, as recorded in the book, They Found the Secret. You ever, if you've never read that book, and I really encourage you to get a copy, it's 20 short biographies uh, of some very dynamic Christians throughout the church age. Some of them you recognize the names, some you won't but to how they all got saved and then eventually were baptized with the Holy Spirit, how it revolutionized their life and ministry. Uh, one such story is about Dr. Walter Wilson. The author uh, tells us that Dr. Wilson was converted to Christ on a December night in 1896. Afterward, and I'm quoting the author now, he became a lover of the scriptures and be became diligent in teaching preaching and distributing tracts. Much effort, however, seemed to produce little result and no apparent success followed his labors. This ineffectiveness troubled him, but he was told by others not to look for results, but only to be busy at sowing the seed. Well, this went on for 17 years until January 14th of 1914 when he went and heard a message given by Dr. James Gray, who would later become the president of Moody Bible Institute. He heard this message preached by Dr. Gray on the need to surrender our lives fully to the Holy Spirit to accomplish his work. Upon hearing this message, Dr. Wilson went home, and, and this I encourage you to really take this to heart. He went home, and there laid on the... See, 17 years, love God, serve God, really no fruit. Very frustrating, you know, when you love God and you're out there witnessing and passing out tracts and nobody's getting saved. So Dr. Wilson heard this message about the need to surrender his life fully to the Holy Spirit. He went home, laid on the floor of his room, utterly heartbroken over his fruitless life and cried out to the Holy Spirit and said, here's his words, My Lord, I have mistreated you all my Christian life. I have treated you like a servant. When I wanted you, I called for you. When I was about to engage in some work, I beckoned you to come and help me perform my task. I have kept you in the place of a servant. I have sought to use you only as a willing servant to help me in my self-appointed and chosen work. I shall do so no more. Just now I give you this body of mine from my head to my feet. I give it to you. I give you my hands, my limbs, my eyes and lips, my brain, 
all that I have within and without, I hand over to you for you to live in in this body and in, in, in working your, your life or what pleases you through me. You may send this body to Africa or lay it on a bed with cancer. You may blind the eyes or send me with your message to Tibet. You may take this body to the Eskimos or send it to the hospital with pneumonia. It is your body from this moment on. Help yourself to it. Thank you, my Lord. I believe you have accepted my prayer, end quote. Now, let me just say this. If you think that prayer was somewhat bizarre and fanatical, you don't understand what it means to be broken. When a person labors that long and that hard and sees no fruit, and has a heart to serve God and to be used by God to make changes in people's lives, it brings you to a point of brokenness. And that's where Dr. Wilson got to. This is where every Christian needs to get to. The author goes on to say that from that day on, Dr. Wilson's life was dramatically and forever changed. He went on to become a tremendous soul winner, all because he came to a place of brokenness and surrender, coupled with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. R.A. Torrey, who was uh, D.L. Moody's right-hand man for many years, R.A. Torrey said, and I quote, The lack of this absolute surrender is shutting many out of the blessings today. People turn the keys of almost every closet in their heart over to God, but there is some small closet of which they wish to keep the key for themselves, and the blessing does not come, end quote. One pastor put it this way. He said, and I quote, What are you holding back from God and refusing to surrender to Him? Is it a relationship? Is it a dream? Is it an object for the rich young ruler? It was his wealth. He, he held on to it. The Lord Jesus is inviting you to follow him completely. Will you accept his invitation? The only way you will ever experience the fullness of God in your life is if you are broken, surrendered, and plugged into a local church using your God-given gifts in ministry. Then pray for the baptism with the Holy Spirit and a fresh filling every day after that." End quote. So, a lot involved with the idea of being anointed by the Holy Spirit. Go back to 1 John 2. Again, verse 27, John said, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Listen. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now, again, as we said last time, when John says, and you do not need that anyone teach you, he, he's not saying that Christians don't need pastors and teachers in the church to teach them anything. We said in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul tells us that Jesus actually gave to his church teaching pastors and other teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Rather, what John is emphasizing, guys, here, is that we have within us as Christians the greatest teacher of the Bible in the universe, the God who wrote the Bible. Remember what Jesus said in John 16? Again, the night before his crucifixion, verse 13. I'm going to send back the Holy Spirit. He will be with you forever. However, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So a lot of things I want to tell you, Jesus said that night to his disciples. You're not ready to handle the, you're, not, you're not ready to handle all that I want to tell you, but the Holy Spirit, when he comes, He'll continue the work I've begun in teaching you. He will abide with you forever. And he will then unfold to your understanding the deeper things. Okay, The epistles are like, you know, the graduate school. Uh, the gospels, you know, K through 12. Okay, 
But the epistles get into the deeper things of God. You don't think so? Read Romans. Okay. Uh, you know, deep theological truths that these little, not little, the young disciples were not ready to handle at that time. I mean, you can't teach a, a, a third grader uh, physics unless they're really smart, okay? Uh, but, you know, obviously, right? And, and so, you know, but the Holy Spirit would continue the work Jesus began. And um, so here's the thing. With the Bible as God's revel revealed truth and the Spirit of God is our teacher of truth, this truth, the Bible, and we have an anointing that teaches us concerning all things and is true. Verse 27. That's what John's talking about. Okay? We have the Word of God. We have the Spirit of God to teach us the Word, give us uh, insights, open our understanding. Between the Word of God and the Spirit of God, we have everything we need. We don't need anyone to teach us anything. We've got all that we need uh, the anointing that teaches us concerning all things, and is true, we have it. It reminds me of what Paul said of the uh, Word of God, okay? He said in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's exactly what John is talking about in different words, okay? You don't need anything else but the Word of God, the Holy Spirit living in you. You're saved, right? You don't, you don't need a seminary degree. There are pastors, and I've heard them on the radio, telling people if you don't have a degree in seminary, you're not qualified to be a pastor. Whoops. Well, I guess I should have learned that a long time ago because I've been a pastor a long time, you know. Look, Paul said, whom the Lord calls, he what? Equips. Who equips? He does. If he calls you into ministry, he will equip you in that ministry. I remember years and years ago when I was a very young pastor, uh, we got an invitation, Cindy and I, to go to uh, Purdue University, spend the night there in one of the dorms, because the next day, the pastor out in Lafayette, Indiana, the Calvary pastor, was going to have Pastor Chuck fly in. He was passing over the country on his way back to California, but he was going to make a special stop. Uh, you know, he had his own pilot, a small aircraft that he would fly around, you know, uh, around the country and teach and things. And so uh, we were all excited. My pa I'm going to see my pastor. I mean, he's 2,000 miles away. I don't get to see my pastor at all. So we went there all excited. And the night before, Chuck was going to come have breakfast and speak to us. We had a little time where pastors just got up and gave their testimony and so on and so forth. And um, I got up very kind of sheepish, uh, almost apologetic that I was calling myself a pastor uh, and I said, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know why God's called me. Uh, I have no degree. I have no formal training and blah, 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 that whole thing. After I got done, another guy stood up, pastor, Calvary guy now. He said, Phil, thank God you didn't go to seminary. I went to seminary. It took me a long time for God to get my head on straight again. A lot of junk is being taught in seminary, a lot of men are losing their faith, not being built up in their faith. I'm so thankful that because my pastor was 2,000 miles away when God called me into ministry, I don't, and I didn't know anybody else around me in ministry, I had to go to God for everything. And that just taught me dependence on God from the very beginning. And that's what I want to share with you. Look, God's got a ministry for every one of us. Whatever that ministry is, He will equip you when He calls you. Remember the accusation against the disciples in Acts 4. I think it was 3 or 4. I think it was 4. How when Peter and John stood boldly against the Sanhedrin, remember? 
And these guys were taken back by the boldness, the power with which these disciples spoke the word of God because they, you know, they were un unlearned and un uneducated men. How could these men be so powerful in their speaking? They haven't gone to our seminary. But then it says, but they realized they had been with Jesus. That is the only criteria for ministry, that you hang out with Jesus. How do you do that? By being in the Word. And the Holy Spirit will give you understanding. He will illuminate. I'm not saying I never read a commentary or a book. I read a lot of stuff. I don't depend on any of it, though, to get me closer to God. I just go to the Lord. I just stay in the Word, okay? But I think also, guys, and don't miss this, okay? Also, I believe what John had in mind when he said that the Holy Spirit, the anointing from Jesus, as he called it, abides in us, and as such, we don't need anyone to teach us. He is saying, again, remember the context now. He's telling us that we don't need any, listen, supplemental so-called truth to know God. Again, this was aimed at the Gnostics and their claim that Christians needed their truth to supplement the Bible, okay? They needed Gnostic insights, Gnostic knowledge, right? Because they, they knew the deeper things of God. So they taught that, you know, yeah, what the apostles are teaching, that's good, that's fine, the Word of God, great, wonderful. But you also need to supplement that with our insights and truth. And John is saying, no, you don't. Because in Christ, Paul said, dwells all the riches uh, of wisdom and knowledge. And you're complete in him, uh, who is the head of all principalities and powers. you got Jesus living inside through the Holy Spirit. you got everything. How can you improve on God living inside your heart? Okay, God, you're in there, but I need something else. Uh, no, come on. That's ridiculous, right? So again, John basically saying when he says you have an anointing that's given to you by Jesus and you don't need to anyone teach you anything else uh, beside you know supplement okay um, we have everything we need to uh, from the Holy Spirit everything we need is found in the Bible to know God to walk with God and to serve God uh, John emphasizes this because in his day and it's no different in our day same thing going on John emphasized this because some Christian groups, well, back then and even today, interpreted this to mean that Christians don't need any teaching from anyone, listen, designated as a teacher in the church. Now, hear me out, okay? There are groups, and we see them today. I'll talk about one in just a second. But um, the, the, uh, the contention goes like this. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit in them, right? Well, sure. Okay. That means that every Christian is a teacher. I mean, if the Holy Spirit lives in every one of us, then nobody can stand up and say, well, I'm a teacher. No, we're all teachers. The Spirit is in all of us, right? And uh, we don't need any other formal teachers to teach us anything from the Bible. Well, again, Ephesians 4, verse 11, Jesus Christ gave to the church apostles, prophets, pastor, teachers, and teachers for the work, equipping of the saints. This seems to have been the mindset. It sounds very spiritual, okay? This seems to be the mindset that the Corinthians had, very deeply spiritual group. Corinthians... And today, groups like the Plymouth Brethren have. What do I mean? Back in Corinth, when they gathered for a service, everyone participated. There was nobody who stood up and said, okay, open your Bibles, okay, uh, here's the pastor going to teach you. No, 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 no. We're, we all have the Holy Spirit within us. And so, you know, everyone did the little thing. Was, one person gave a psalm. Another gave a prophecy. This one, you know. And they all kind of participated because that was the most spiritual way to do it. We had a brother in our church years ago, and he went off to start a Calvary. And he worked with a group of guys that were Plymouth Brethren. 
and uh, and and all. And their th when they have a church service, they don't have pastors or formal teachers. They all participate, okay? Because who is who are you, Phil Ballmeyer, to say you're the teacher? Hey, we all have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Therefore, anyone can stand up and give a little teaching or a little ex exhortation or or whatever. And that was how they did it, okay? Sounds spiritual. It's not biblical. Sounds spiritual, though. So when John says, look, you have an anointing given to you by Jesus Christ, and you don't have need of anyone to teach you anything. The Spirit of God teaches you all things. That's not to say that we don't go to church and hear teachers and read commentaries and study on our own. It just means that we don't need any other group to tell us that, you know what, the Bible, that's great, but you also need our insights, our teaching. You also need the works of uh, Mary Baker, Eddie, uh, keys to understanding the scriptures because you can't, you know, she's been anointed by God to, to unlock in your mind the truths of God. That is exactly the kind of thing that John's coming against. Back in his day, it was the Gnostics. Today, fill in the blank. So back to 1 John 2, verse 28. John says as he wraps up his thought in this chapter, And now, little children, abide in him. Again, the Greek word is meno, and it means to continue, to remain, to keep walking with Jesus, to keep in the word of God is the idea that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, uh, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Now, John ends this chapter with a practical exhortation that the Christians abide in Jesus and in his word by encouraging them, and us of course, to abide in the word of God by living a Christian life, listen, worthy of our Savior. In other words, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers. You want to abide in Christ? Well, that doesn't just mean coming to church and hearing the Bible taught. It means that you study it, take it to heart, and that you obey what it says. That's what it means to remain, right? Remain. Stay in fellowship. Continue on in the faith and in the truths of God. It's a lot more than just coming to church and hearing the Bible. James says a lot of folks come to church, they hear the word, they think that's, they think that's all they need to do, and they go out and never really apply any of it. And he said that is they're deceiving themselves into thinking that all God wants is for you to come to church and hear the Bible taught. And then you're free. <laughs> you walk through those doors... Okay, done that. That's done for the week. Now I can just live whatever, any way I want. That's kind of what a lot of people think today. All right? Obedience is the key. And guys, when we walk in obedience to what God has said, this is going to glorify God, but also will prove that we, are, we truly belong to Him. As He said at the end of verse 29, everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. So not only are we exhorted to, to obey what we learn, it also, though, helps to, uh, to uh, assure us that we're children of God. Unbelievers don't practice righteousness because they're not righteous. They're unbelievers. Somebody who has got Christ in their heart through the Holy Spirit, they're going to want to live for the Lord, right? We all want to live for the Lord. You look at your life, it's not perfect. Mine isn't. But I'm certainly not what I used to be when it comes to how I live my life. And I know it's the same for you. We practice righteousness and once in a while sin. Back in the old days, we sinned all the time and once in a while did something right. Big difference, right? Now, John also said something that should be a sober warning to all Christians. And that is that when Jesus returns for his church, and I believe he's talking about the rapture, some, probably many, or if we're talking about America, maybe most Christians, professing Christians, will be ashamed at his coming. Now, let that sink in. 
We don't want to be like those who are ashamed when he comes for us at the rapture, implying many will be ashamed. Now, they're true Christians, all right? We're saved by grace. We can be carnal and still be saved. Okay, read 1 Corinthians chapters 2 and 3, because Paul talks about three different groups. The natural man, unbeliever, the spiritual man, on fire Christian, and then the soulish or the carnal man. And he's talking about Christians because he calls them brethren. He says that God, Jesus Christ has given you all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Lord doesn't give the gifts of the Holy Spirit to unbelievers. So these folks were saved in Corinth, but very carnal. I wish I could speak to you as the spiritual people. I can't. You're babes in Christ. How do I know that? Because you're arguing and bickering and divisions and schisms. Among, you're acting like mere men, not like spirit-filled believers. So you could be a carnal Christian and still be saved. But when the rapture happens, you're going to be ashamed at his appearing. The New Testament teaches us, guys, that someday... All Christians will have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account for the life they've lived while on the earth. And based on our faithfulness now, we'll determine our rewards then on that day. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3. I just wanted to bring this out since John actually touches on it. And guys, this is not to condemn. It's to challenge. It's to challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm not bringing this out to condemn anyone. If you're living a life that's more carnal than spiritual, let's, let's change that. Let's do something about it. So that when he appears, we rejoice, not ashamed. Oh, they didn't live for him. I remember reading a story one time about a Christian who was on his deathbed dying of something. And they asked him, what was his biggest regret? He said, my biggest regret is that I didn't get my, my uh, addiction to pornography under control. Now look, there are Christians that wrestle with that. Jesus loves them. But he wants to give you victory. He doesn't want you. You've been set free. I've been set free. We need to walk in that freedom, not to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, right? And just keep your eyes on him and keep putting him first in, in all things, right? But we are going to have to stand before the Lord someday and give an account. Now, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about this, starting with verse 9. He says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, on the foundation of Christ. For no other foundation can anyone lay that, uh, than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, that day we stand before him, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So Paul says the day's coming when we are going to all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and our work is going to be tested. Not the quantity, not the sheer volume per se, but the quality of the work that we did for him. Understand, guys, the fire that Paul speaks of does not test the worker. Does not test the worker. Even though Roman Catholics use this passage in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, to teach purgatory. But that's not Paul's point. There's no purgatory, but that's not Paul's point. 
He's not saying the fire will test the worker. The fire will test their work or their workmanship. The distinction, guys, listen now, isn't between the lost and the saved, but between the faithful saved and the unfaithful saved, between those who built well and those who built poorly or didn't build at all. Didn't serve Christ at all. That's the idea. Further understand that this judgment, this is the Bema seat. We must all appear before the Bema seat of Christ. This judgment is not punitive. Okay? This does not determine if a person goes to heaven or hell. Anyone who stands before Jesus in this judgment, the, the Bema seat, 1 Corinthians 3, they're all, they've already made it to heaven. Okay? They're all saved. This is not about unbelievers and believers. It's about faithful saved and unfaithful saved. This is about rewards now. Uh, we, we all get heaven as believers in Christ. That's equal across the board. But we don't all get the same rewards. That is determined by our faithfulness in serving the Lord right now on the earth. Unfortunately, we just talked about carnal Christians a few minutes ago. Unfortunately, many Christians will have lived a worthless, wasted life on the earth, spiritually speaking. And so when they stand before Jesus that day, um, they're going to be ashamed. Their works are going to be tested by fire. And, uh, well, part of what's involved here is, were their works done for the glory of God or for the glory of self? Were their works done out of self-direction or were they directed by the Holy Spirit? What was the motive of their heart? Again, was it to glorify God or to draw attention to themselves? God knows the heart. That's why, remember what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels or the motives of the heart, and then each one's praise will come from God. I can't see in your heart. I can't, you know, you, you do something for the Lord. I can't say, I know, I know, I know what's in their heart. They're just doing it to get recognized, you know, have people praise them. I don't know that. And, and, and Paul says, don't do that. You don't know a person's heart, but God does. And when a person comes walking up to the throne with all the stuff they did for him, I, can, I just visualize this, right? Got, their arms are loaded down with all these works they did for the Lord, Right? And they've they got to walk through some kind of fire. And as they walk through the fire, if the motive wasn't right, if it wasn't done for the love of God, it was done more for a love of self and recognition, as they walk through the fire, poof, they come walking. Where's all my stuff? <laughs> come walk. They're saved because we're not saved by our works. So they're still going to heaven, but they don't have much to show for their time on the earth. And that's something Paul says, I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to serve the Lord because you love him. And make that your priority. And don't love the world. Don't get chained to the world. Don't lay up treasures on the earth. Lay up treasures in heaven. And someday when you stand before the Lord, you won't be ashamed. You'll hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we should live for. All right, let's get into chapter 3. We have a little time. John begins chapter 3. And remember, there's no chapters in the original, okay? So it's, it's one continuous thought, although he does shift gears and, and uh, change subjects. Right now, chapter 3 begins with, well, John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Do you, do you get the impression he's overwhelmed? He's overwhelmed. The statement, behold, what manner of love, the Amplified translates that, see what an incredible quality of love the Father has given, shown, bestowed on us. This statement reflects John's amazement 
at how great God's love is towards his children. Look, God so loves the world. God loves all people. But he cannot bestow gifts and blessings on unbelievers like he does his kids, right? He's waiting for them to receive his son Jesus Christ so that he can adopt them into his family and then begin to pour out the blessings on their lives. So I'm not saying that God doesn't love unbelievers. John 3.16, of course he does. He loves the whole world. But what John the Apostle is talking about now is the love that God shows towards his kids in the way of blessings. The Greek word translated behold, or some of your translations might say uh, have the word see. In the Greek is both a command and an exclamation that exhorts readers to give close attention to the next rest of the statement. The next uh, phrase is what manner. Behold what manner, my New King James translates it. Some of yours might translate it, see how great. One scholar said that phrase is seldom used is a seldom used term that has no precise parallel in English. It occurs only seven times in the New Testament and implies a reaction of astonishment and usually of admiration upon viewing some person or thing. The expression conveys both a qualitative and quantitative force. What glorious, measureless love, end quote. That's the idea. John is just stumbling over himself to find superlatives to use to, to talk about God's love. He, it's beyond uh, anything he can express. Now, <clears throat> I know that I've told you this before, and, uh, but I, I just want to bring it up tonight just for a second. Uh, one of the greatest hymns ever written on the subject of God's love was written by a man named William, excuse me, Frederick M. Lehman in 1917 and was simply called The Love of God. Now you can go online and uh, pull it up. It just, it's got some beautiful stanzas. The final stanza was not in the original. It was added later to this particular hymn. After it had, it had been found, after it had been found scratched on the wall of a cell in an asylum by a man said to have been insane. After he died, they were cleaning out his cell. They found this scratched on the wall. Apparently, he knew of the hymn and added his own final stanza to it. Here's how it goes. Could we with the love of God, right? Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. He sounds pretty sane to me. Maybe he was considered crazy because he was simply a follower of Jesus Christ. One author put it well, he said, and I quote, God loves believers with a love that is impossible to articulate in any human language and that is utterly foreign to normal human understanding and experience. This is agape love, God's love, God's volitional love. The Lord summarized it this way, greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And later in this very epistle that we are studying, John says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, first loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Now, that is not some glib phrase we toss around, although we do. That is a very, 
That is a title that cost Jesus Christ his life that we might own. In this statement, John is not speaking universally of all mankind, but exclusively of those who have received Jesus as their Savior. You know, many people like to talk about how all people are children of God. <laughs> well, that is incorrect. All people are the creation of God, but only the redeemed are the children of God, and these are those that John is addressing in verse 1 of chapter 3. Of course, John tells us at the beginning of his gospel what it takes for a person to become a child of God. John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who, who believe in his name. Believing and receive. What do we say about a gift? How do you receive a gift from God? You believe, you ask, you receive. God is handing, holding out eternal life through his son to every person on the planet. And to receive it, all you got to do is say, Lord, I believe in your son. I receive your gift of eternal life. And, and, and you are then a child of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Guys, by saying this, John isn't implying that because we're Christians, people of this world don't know who we are. Of course, people know who we are. He uses the Greek word gnosko. When he says, um, therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Jesus. The Greek word gnosko, which speaks of a deep, personal, intimate, experiential knowledge. The kind of knowledge we read about in Matthew's gospel when it says that Joseph took Mary to be his wife, but didn't know her until after Jesus was born. Matthew 1, verses 24 and 5. What does that mean? He didn't know who she was? Of course he knew who she was. He didn't know her. He didn't have physical relations with her until after Christ was born. Then they went on to have a normal family. At least four, uh, four brothers, at least two sisters, but they had a normal family. The Greek word for world is cosmos and is a reference to the fallen world system that Satan rules over of course those belonging to the devil's kingdom of darkness have no intimate knowledge the idea is koinonia oneness fellowship of course those belonging to satan his kids who belong to his kingdom kingdom of darkness of course john says you know they they didn't know they don't know us they didn't know him of course not the world does not have that kind of intimate deep experiential relationship with they can go to church they know who jesus is I'm talking about a deep, intimate relationship like a husband has with his wife. That's the kind of oneness we're talking about. Very deep, very intimate. And the reason unbelievers don't have that kind of relationship with believers is because light can have no fellowship with darkness, right? Turn to 2 Corinthians 6, and we'll close. Of course, the context that Paul's talking about is marriage. Don't be unequally yoked if you're a Christian to an unbeliever. Here's what he says, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord is Christ with Belial or Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? That's why John says the world, we are of a total different world once we get saved. A whole different family, the family of God. He's going to hit that pretty strong next time. Listen, and we're done. Let me just say this in closing. The world isn't our friend. In fact, Jesus warned us it would be our mortal enemy. You can read John 15, verses 18 and 19. Where that, well, I'll read it to you. If the world hates you, 
okay, talking to his disciples. No, it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And that's why John commanded us earlier in chapter 2 of this epistle. He said, do not love the world or anything in the world. If you love the world, you can't love the Father. Because they're mutually exclusive worlds. In fact, James put it even more, as James often did, succinctly and pointedly in James 4, verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself, herself, an enemy of God. And yet, many churches today are trying to be friends with the world. Trying to be friends with the people of the world in an effort, listen, to win them over the philosophy being like the world to reach the world. You know, to show people of this world that Christians, we're just normal folks, you know? We like to get in there and tell a good story and, you know, have a glass of wine, lift a beer once in a while. I mean, come on. We need to show the world that we're like them. Is if that's going to win the world over. Let me tell you something. You try to be like the world to reach the world, you know what the world's going to say behind your back? You're a hypocrite. They're not going to be impressed. You're trying to be like them. The power of the church has always been in its separateness from the world. Not holier than thou or self-righteous. Living in the world, loving the people of the world, yet not being of the world ourselves. Being a light in the darkness. That's what draws people. Yeah, some people run away from the light. Others are drawn to it. That's the, the power of the church. It's always been in its separateness. I am so saddened to see so many churches trying to be like the world to reach the world. Folks, if you're somewhere and you see somebody has fallen into quicksand, what do you do, jump in to try to pull them out? Or do you stand on the shore and throw them a rope? The rope is the gospel. You don't jump in to the world to try to save anybody in the world. It's a demonic trap. Don't fall for it. Our power is in our separateness from the world. So may God give us grace. We will pick it up there next time. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the light it provides for us. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your kindness, Lord. Work within us that we would draw from the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work you've called us to do and to be a light in this dark world. Lord, we thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.